What kind of fa- Don't fall asleep. Hello and welcome to Horror Court Trash Over the Show that discusses all of the masterpieces and trash the pieces of genre cinema. I'm Gary. And I'm Chris. Welcome to Five Weeks at Freddy's. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's where we are. It's <laughs> five weeks. Five weeks of October this year. And uh, yeah, we are here. That's a game, isn't it? Five, five Nights at Freddy's. Five yes. Nights. Thank you Thank for telling you. everyone the, the pun that I stole from. Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, I see. To, to celebrate the release of Five Nights at Freddy's in cinema soon. <laughs> I think that is coming out soon. Yeah. It was the game. It's I, I thought I was being clever. I just well, you were being very clever. Thank you. you. Were being Thank very you. Clever. I appreciate. It. Hopefully, the listeners think the same. Yes. Um, try again. Five weeks of Freddy's. Oh, <laughs> to coincide with the release of Five Nights at Freddy's yes. film. Wow, we we sponsored. Uh, not quite. Oh, not quite. But if you want to sponsor me, we've still got a few more of these episodes to go. So hit me up. Um, but yes, Five Weeks of Freddy's is essentially. The Nightmare on Elm Street films that we haven't discussed yet on the podcast. We've discussed part one. We've discussed the 2010 remake. Thankfully, it means we never have to watch that again. And we discussed part two. For our gay listeners, Freddy's Revenge. For our straight listeners, the gay one. But today... (laughs) Well, first of all, no, actually, no. I think it's the gay one for everyone. But, well, I mean, we have another gay one to discuss today. Um, But before we get into that, Shall we talk about our history with this franchise? Because the franchise. I know for me, it's my joint first favorite franchise with Scream. Yours, I believe, is your number one. It's my number one franchise. Yeah. Yes. What's your history? Um. Well, essentially, I'd heard of Nightmare on Elm Street back in the day with all the horror films and such, and it happened to be on TV one evening, and I, I'd, I'd heard. My brother had spoken about this one that he'd seen around a friend's house. I had cousins who had a kind of like a cardboard cutout promotional thing in Mm -hmm. their bedroom. And I was like, okay, I really want to watch this. And years went by and it never really happened. And it was on TV uh, one night. I I believe it was TCM, weirdly enough. And I watched it, and I thought it was the best thing I'd ever seen. Yeah. And luckily, I'd recorded it as yeah. well. And first thing I did the next day, I woke up and I watched it again. Yeah. The original, of course. The original, excuse me. Uh, A Nightmare on Elm Street. And then I bought... Um, uh, This won't hold up in court, hopefully. <laughs> I bought what I found... Out after receiving it was a really bad, um, what's it called? Bootleg. Bootleg. Thank you. <laughs> Bootleg version of all the films off of eBay. Wow. Okay, Captain Jack Sparrow over here. And then I watched them all, and I was like, "Yeah, I really enjoyed that." <laughs> and essentially, ever since, you know, I I love rewatching them. I love the whole franchise, even. The, the not so great ones just give me that kind of childlike horror yeah feeling do you know what i mean yeah. you know when you because they're not so heavy and they're just fun and it's kind of the feeling i get when i watch the first one and do you know what i mean yeah 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 no absolutely i mean it's got to be the franchise i've watched the most Mm. Oh, absolutely. Me too. I mean, I'm pretty sure we watch it at least once every year. Um, The whole thing. But I remember, it. I believe it was also on TCM that I saw bits of the first one. I was a little too scared to watch it all in in one go at that point. But then when given the opportunity, um, and my dad had the box set, I chose to watch part four first. Because my thinking was at that time, when I was a bit of a scaredy cat, oh, it's a 15, so it, it won't be as scary as the others. Uh, and oh my god, yeah, I just fell in love with the franchise. Then I had to start it from the beginning. I went from one, um, and just watch all of them. Watch the remake in the cinema. Um, and yeah, I just 
I just love it. I just love it so much. It's just so camp. And one of my biggest comforts with watching films is camp. So even though the series is about a child murderer, it's still rather comforting. I think there's a huge amount of camp in the series. Yeah. I really do. And time, obviously, is a factor with these. Um, I'd seen Scream before I'd seen A Nightmare on Elm Street. So uh, and the film was kind of ridiculed in Scream. Yeah. To a certain degree. So that aspect of it, I was so f- just thoroughly entertained. Mm. And I just thought it was, I watched it, the original, and thought it was the best thing. Yeah. I thought this is amazing. And I did my usual IMDb search of all the, you know, cast and the films that came after and everything. And I, I actually credit A Nightmare on Elm Street the original, and we have done an episode on a Nightmare on Elm Street, <laughs> but I credit it with introducing me to more serious cinema. Yeah. I'm not going to say better, but more serious cinema. Yeah. Because I found out Ronnie Blakely had been nominated for an Oscar for Nashville. I was like, oh yeah. my God, I need to watch Nashville. You know, and I, I it, it's weird, but as gay men, we tend to do this. We kind of find very random actresses and follow their career <laughs> because Ronnie Blakely's not a huge actress, no. you know, but we, we follow their career and um, I watched Nashville and I, yeah. I genuinely thought Nashville was the best film. And, mm. and to this day, it's still in my top 10. You know, I thought Nashville was the best film that I had ever watched. Yeah. Um, and it all came from there, from a nightmare yeah. on Elm Street, really. Absolutely. Well, by this point in the franchise where we're starting today, we've seen the original where Nancy Thompson, she killed Freddy Krueger only for him to come back and snatch Ronnie Blakely, Oscar nominated Ronnie Blakely through a door yeah. uh, and drive her and her friends off to what we thought may have been their death. After that, Freddy wanted to get inside Jesse, who moved into the house and possess him for some reason. This has never been done again in the franchise. Uh, and the kiss of a good woman saved him until they were murdered at the end by Freddy, as far as we know. That brings us to A Nightmare on Elm Street, Part 3, a little independent film at the time called Dream Warriors in 1987, also known as A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Tragedy House in Japan, oh. and Freddy Free, Claws of the Nightmare in France. Nice. Freddy Free, Claws of the Nightmare. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the first film, New Line Cinema's first massive success. Yeah. Uh, the second film, not critically acclaimed at all, but a huge box office success. Yeah. And so this one ups the ante, as sequels tend to do when the ones before them have made money. Um, but yeah, it, it's coming from a good position, yeah. should we say terms of the franchise yeah no absolutely money um, what money, money was, was yeah I, I quite like freddy's revenge you know yeah so. no absolutely um i you know as we said enjoy all the films in this franchise mm. um but this i don't know freddy's dead's a little bit of a stretch yeah but i actually it? think dream child is oh no we shouldn't get into let's this. let's There's more let's, episodes we'll say that. We'll say, yeah <laughs> i mean probably a good idea to mention now we're not going to do freddy versus jason but we'll be doing that as part of what our friday the 13th episode yeah eventually. it'll bring everything to a head um yeah this for me is probably top five greatest horror sequels of all time this is for me the perfect sequel and is almost as good as the original it's really, really close. Because to being as good as the original. It takes the concept and goes so far with it in a way that, you know, it's clever. It's clever. You're dealing with a villain here who kills people in their dreams. Fucking go over the top. Go silly. Go camp. And I love it. I love what it does. It benefits greatly from the bigger budget. Mm. Like really, really benefits yeah. from it. It goes balls to the wall. It it's we've been known to critique remakes on this podcast that feel like they have to go over the top with everything. But we're gonna be. I, I mean, I'm a little hypocritical 
because I like that this yeah, and it's not a remake. It's not a remake, but as a sequel, it does something similar but goes over the top with it. Yeah, it goes balls to the wall, and obviously we'll discuss it during the episode. I mean, it's the first kind of. I mean, I've said this a few times over the last few months on the podcast. Well, since Screen Five was released, actually. Um, but this has got to be one of the first recalls, really. I know it's like released a short amount of time after the first film, but really, it ignores part two because it didn't. I mean, as far as we know, it's canon, but it's not mentioned at all. No. Instead, it brings back legacy characters who aren't safe, and mixes it with a younger generation of characters in such a way that feels very much like a requel. Yeah, yeah. I I do... No, it doesn't ignore Freddy's Revenge. No? No. Do you not see the scene where um, Nancy pulls out her diary? Oh, shit, yeah. Starts talking about... Erotic novelist. (laughs) Erotic (laughs) diary entries. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Well, we'll get into uh, a certain Queen's Return soon. But first, this is written and directed by Chuck Russell, who directed The Mask, The Scorpion King, Eraser, Paradise City, I Am Wrath, and more, including in previous podcast film, The Blob remake. Joseph Rubin was the studio's first choice to direct a film, having already directed the similarly themed Dreamscape in 1984. But he was forced to direct, uh, he was forced to decline to direct, Due to having already signed on to direct another podcast film, The Stepfather. Oh, okay. So he instead recommended his Dreamscape co-writer Chuck Russell for the job. So this was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Chuck Russell's first film as director. I believe so. Yeah, I think it was. By all accounts, um, he was rather difficult to work with yeah. on set. Um, but by all accounts, New Line Cinema... Historically, have been very difficult to work with yes. on sets. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, we've seen obviously the mask. Mm-hmm. Oh, fun film. Yeah, has, has it aged well? Have we watched it together? We did watch it together, and we did say it didn't age. It hasn't aged particularly well. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, the blog. Childhood classic. Great remake. I haven't seen the Scorpion King. I have. And Eraser is so high up. On my uh, watch list because it features again, unless I'm oh no, Vanessa Williams. Nice. So I'm definitely want to watch that, but the others, yeah. Bless the child is that a random? Bless the child. That's the film with the decapitation on a railway, if I remember right. Oh okay, is that the oh Kim? That's Bas- all I remember about it. Yeah, Kim Basinger's in it. Yeah, Christina Ricci's in it too. Uh huh. Nice. Okay. Um, co-written by Wes Craven, of course, you know who he is. The creator of A Nightmare on Elm Street, Scream, Last House on the Left, Hills of Eyes, etc., etc. Uh, he had nothing to do with the first sequel, uh, Freddy's Revenge, as he didn't believe that Elm Street was capable of spawning a franchise. The success of that film, outgrossing the original, convinced him otherwise. And his original premise for this involved Freddy invading the real world and haunting the actors and crew responsible for A Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh. Which was inspired by Return to Horror High. Oh. Which was a never met a horror film at the time. However, this idea was rejected by the studio for being too ambitious. But it may come back for a later film. Maybe. When you know, such a good idea. I know when New Line were like, Do you know what? Let's be ambitious. I hope he gets to make that twice, twice within a decade. Day. That'd be great. Uh, also co-written by Bruce Wagner, who did Maps to the Stars, Night of Cups, Wild Palms, Young Lust, The People Next Door, and more. And co-written by future Oscar nominee Frank Darabont, who did The Green Mile, The Mist, The Shawshank Redemption, The Walking Dead, Frankenstein 1994, The Blob Remake, and more. Wow. So at the, the director of The Shawshank Redemption... Uh, the Green Mile and the Mist. Oh, he also directed. He directed. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. He loves the Stephen King adaptation. Yeah, yeah. He was. Uh, yeah, and they're and some of the highest rated ones. Three yeah. of the best, actually. Mm. Yeah. The, well, by all accounts, the Mist was very good. Mist was great. It? Yeah, yeah. Uh, budget four point five million dollars, and it made a whopping forty four point seven million dollars at the box office. 
What a big whopper. It's <laughs> what a big whopper. <laughs> um, it's one of those things I forget that these films were big box office successes. Yeah. And you I, I don't know why I forget it, but it's not talked about. No. I don't think horror being a big box office success in the sort of 80s, uh, particularly, was spoken about a lot. Yeah. Particularly these kind of horror films. These sequels made of a ton of money. Yeah. is why you have these franchises. And you mm-hmm. look at it and you look at box office mojo and you... You see the usual suspects, and, you know, your pretty woman, your Titanics, your this, that, and the other. Yeah. And then you sort of, you don't have to scroll down very far, mm-hmm. unless you're a new nightmare, um, to see these films. No. And it's like, oh, wow. You know, I, I never really see it like that. Yeah. Because people don't talk about it like that. They're like oh, huge box office successes. Yeah. It, it, yeah, like I said, it's your usual suspect. Yeah, I mean, this was the first film from New Line Cinema to receive a national theatrical release. Mm. Um, prior to this, their films were released on a regional basis, opening in several cities, one month, moving to other cities the next. And even though... Um, kind of related. Kind of not related. Yeah, kind of related. One part of the world, anyway. Even though Dream Warriors was rated M15+, plus in other states of Australia... It was banned in Queensland by then. Uh, I'm going to try and pronounce this. Jelk Peterson government due to its drug content. In 1990, oh. the Queensland Film Board, a review was abolished by the then premier uh, Wayne Goss and the film was no longer banned. Uh, but yes, yeah, so even whilst banned in certain parts of the world, it went on to make a shit ton of money. And it is the one that when you think of the sequels, everyone knows this one. We're not counting Freddy vs. Jason. No. Everyone knows Dream Warriors. You know? Yeah. No, no. Um, I agree. This this is... Back in the day, what, what I heard from my brother, he'd watch the film on VHS at a sleepover around yeah. his friend's house, and he was telling me about how this girl had her head shoved into the TV. Mm-hmm. And... I imagined, you know, what that looked like. It looked absolutely nothing like the <laughs> finished product. Uh, but in my head, I was like, oh, my God, you know, how disturbing, how, you know, mm. horrific. You know, I was very young at the time. But this was the one, maybe even more than the original, probably showing my age, you know, that was in discussion. Yeah. That was like, that and Jack Frost, for some strange reason. But that might have just been the school I went to. <laughs> But it was Scream, Jack Frost, and A Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Yeah. You know, and there's quite a difference yeah. in time scale there. But this is the one people talked about. Honestly, that's so weird for me. It was American Pie, The Mummy, American Beauty, and then eventually Freddy vs. Jason. <laughs> oh, oh, in terms of horror, yeah. In terms of... I remember distinctly, and I don't know why. Probably because I really wanted to watch the film afterwards, and we only watched it quite recently. We had a drama lesson and somebody um, did a dramatic retelling of Jack Frost. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. How not, is that allowed? Not the Michael Keaton one, but it was meant to be like a scary Halloween sort or whatever. And he did this dramatic <laughs> reading. And at the end, we were all like, oh, wow, that's such a good story. It's like, oh, it's Jack Frost, the film. <laughs> Please tell me you did not mention the Sean Elizabeth. Shower scene. No, no it wasn't. It, it was. It was a bit more succinct than that. It wasn't every single scene. Okay. It wasn't a podcast episode <laughs> on Jack Frost. Um, but I was like, oh my god, I need to watch this film. It sounds amazing, and it it was kind of amazing when we watched yeah, it. it was fun. Finally, it was fun. good yeah. future podcast film. But yeah, it was. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it was the one copy of Dream Warriors <laughs> that went around. The school. Maybe, maybe, but you know. This was one of those films. Well, before we do our dramatic retelling of Dream Warriors, should we talk about who's in it? Uh, yes, in a section we like to call, Hey, I know you, and you, and you, and you. So and many, oh my god, there's so, so many famous many. people in this film. Yeah, starting with the Queen herself. We've, we've done her Hey, I Know You a few times, but mm-hmm. in case this is your first episode, Heather Langenkamp is back with a fucking vengeance as Nancy Thompson. Heather Langenkamp took this role 
didn't have to go as hard as she did. But she was like, you know what? It's not just a paycheck. I'm going to turn up. I'm going to fucking serve cunt. And I am going to give you everything in this fucking role. As I slay the house down boots in every single fucking scene. Even at a fucking funeral. Even at a funeral. Like her documentary says, she is Nancy. She is. She is Nancy. Rooney Mara's got nothing on her. No. No. Um, Yeah, well, what's she famous for? So much. Who, Rooney Mara? No. Heather Langenkamp. (laughs) Oh yeah, oh, she, this is a section we like sorry, to call. I, was, hey, I know, yeah, I, know. I was just lost in appreciating this Heather Lang Camp. You know, Rooney Mara show. Uh, Heather Lang Camp, of course, is the star of the original Nightmare on Elm Street, New Nightmare, Just the Ten of Us, The Midnight Club, The Demolitionist, The Butterfly Room, Star Trek Into Darkness, Heart of the City, and more. Tonya and Nancy. To- um, oh yeah, Tonya and Nancy. Nickel Mountain. There's a few. So when I was doing my own. IMDb searches. Yeah. Um, notice how I didn't have a list of Heather Langenkamp films. No. Out. And, you no. know, I, 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 I do now. Um, but I wasn't necessarily desperate to watch The Demolitionist when I had Nashville and Enter the Dragon on the other end well, of things. Well. Um, but she's had a fantastic career as a scream queen. Yeah, absolutely. And then... You know, like we've mentioned many times, behind the scenes, mm. with special effects with her husband. Yeah. So, a real horror legend. She is. Heather Langenkamp. Craig Wasson plays Dr. Neil Gordon. Again, another one who's Hey, I Know You Have Done Before on mm-hmm. here. Uh, Body Double, previous podcast film. Fantastic in Body Double. Malcolm X, George's Friends, Schizoid, The Pornographer, Murder, She Wrote, Ghost Story... Under Pressure, The Last Best Sunday, and more. Yeah, um, probably someone who could have been a big leading man, but yeah. I don't think it ever really happened No, for him. Um, it's just a shame, really, because everything I've seen him in, I've enjoyed. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Patricia Arquette plays Kristen Parker. Uh, she was in True Romance, Boyhood, Medium, Stigmata, Lost Highway... Toy Story 4, Holes, Edward, Little Nicky, Bringing Out the Dead, and more. Perhaps the actress from the film who's gone on to the most successful career. Yeah, yeah. And Robert Englund admits that he knew that. He knew that was going to happen. He also explains how all the guys on set were head over heels in love with her. Uh, They're even going to him for advice on whether or not he thought they had a chance with her. (laughs) She does have... A quality in this film. Yeah. Considering it's her first feature length film, mm-hmm. she does really well. Yeah. She has a likability, which is so important to the mm-hmm. role. Um, and, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. so I don't know if the first time I watched it, I was like, oh yeah, that's Patricia Arquette. I wasn't, I wasn't familiar with her massively. But watching it back you're like, oh, okay mm. you know there is a star quality there definitely yeah. even if she went through a rough time on set because chuck russell was not very pleasant to her and has even admitted himself he pushed her too hard because uh of how tense things were on the set uh because everything in the script called for a 20 million dollar budget and they only had a 4.5 million dollar budget um and yeah, it wasn't a particularly ideal setting for a film debut. On her first day of filming, the production was already so behind that it didn't get to her scenes till 4am, by which point she'd forgotten all of her lines and it took 52 takes of her making her way through it before they simply fed her the lines via cue cards behind the camera. Yeah, it's a shame. Yeah. It, it is a shame. You know, no young actress should be waiting around till 4am no. to film her scenes. You know, of course, it's not going to work out 100% perfect. No, at all. And the role originally could have been given to Winona Ryder. She auditioned for it. Winona? Winona. <laughs> Winona. You said Winona. Winona. Yeah. Winona Ryder. Um, did she audition for she it? She auditioned for it, but Chuck Russell thought she was too young. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah, potentially. Of course, we have Robert Englund. As Freddy Krueger, who's part of the whole franchise, apart from the remake. Uh, he's in The Mangler, Stranger Things, Dead and Buried, Urban Legend, Hatchet, 
Eating Alive, Wishmaster, Behind the Master, Rise of Leslie Vernon, and more. He's been on a lot of podcast films. Yeah, well, he's a horror film legend. He is. Another one. Yeah, I mean, again, someone else who went for a tough time on set. It was one week during filming. He was working 24 hours every day. By day, he was wrapping up filming on a television series downtown, and then uh, he'd go to Dream Warrior set at night time. The TV show called Downtown. Yes. He was didn't it actually, actually just go down? Yeah, he didn't oh. actually just go downtown. Oh, okay. Based on the Petula Clark. Song. Yeah, well, here's hoping. Uh, and also, speaking of Freddy, it's a known fact that the Freddy glove was stolen from the set. <gasps> Chuck Russell gave a recent interview and gave a little more of an explanation as to the circumstances of how it was stolen. Uh, apparently, two hardcore Freddy fans snuck into the set and disguised themselves as movie grips. Nobody noticed the two throughout the day. And while on break, they grabbed the Freddy glove and left when no one was looking. Rumour has it, it's the one that appears in Evil Dead 2, but who knows. Um, How can you be a fan of something and go out of your way to make it difficult? I know, to to make make the the film. film. (laughs) Like, why would you do... Oh, I'm such a fan of Beyonce. I'm going (laughs) to steal her microphone. (laughs) Like, why would you do that? Stupid. Yeah. People are stupid. Uh huh. And weird. Next up, we have Lawrence Fishburne, or as he was known back then, Larry Fishburne as Max Daniels. Of course, the star of the Matrix trilogy, Contagion, Mystic River, What's Love Got to Do with It, John Wick 2, 3, and 4, Predators, School Days, Event Horizon, King of New York. Again, probably actually, probably the actor who went on to the bigger success. Maybe, potentially, else. yeah. yeah. Yeah, it could be. I think in terms of box office, you look at those films, it's yeah. like, wow. You know, he's a household name as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he, very small role. Mm. Doesn't even get a death scene. He doesn't get a death scene. Alert. He doesn't get a death scene, no. But um, yeah, it's it's a good franchise for, you know, people just starting out and then going on to bigger things. Because, I mean, you know, you even look at the first one, we had Johnny Depp, and then you look this, you know, you have Lawrence Fishburne and Patricia Arquette in the same film. It's great. It's, it's always good to see. Yes. Yeah. Giving young actors. Horror films have always given young actors yeah. their leg up into yeah. uh, film roles. For good or for bad. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's the way they were treated wasn't particularly nice. No. Uh, John Saxon is back as Donald Thompson, yes. star of A Nightmare on Elm Street, Enter the Dragon, Black Christmas, Tenebrae from Dust Till Dawn, Nightmare Beach, Howlmaster, My Mum's a Werewolf, There's many, many, many more. A real cult movie legend. Yeah. Um, he's done every genre possible. Yeah. Um, real charismatic actor, you know. Could have went real mainstream, I oh, feel, yeah. but he's been in, he's been in some real fucking fantastic films. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't think I need to say too much about no. John Saxon. Priscilla Pointer plays Doctor Elizabeth Sims, and she is of course star of Blue Velvet, Carrie, Twilight Zone the movie, Mummy Dearest, The Rage, Carrie Two, Honeysuckle, Honeysuckle Rose, even Acts of Love, Painted Desert, and more. Yeah, she character actress. Yeah, I would say Amy Irving's mother uh-huh. in real life. Yeah, um, yeah, I d- she is another one of those random actresses that I kind of latched on to. Yeah, uh, when I was younger, that, that I thought was the biggest star, and it was like, oh no, she's not. <laughs> it's Priscilla Pointer, you know. Like, Oh wow, it's Priscilla Point. Well, she could be the biggest star to you. Well, she could be, but you know, it, it's it's the way of the gay man. Yeah, I feel we like doing that, and it's wonderful, and I love doing it, and I will do it. Yes, for the rest of my life. And finally, at the end of the longest hair I know you ever, <laughs> we have the mother of a star of a previous podcast film. Um, we last saw her daughter. Uh, doing the robot before being killed by uh, Roy. Roy. Ambulance driver that is Roy. Roy, yes. Of course, mother of Tiffany Helm, Violet Friday the 13th, Part 5, A New Beginning. It's Brooke Bundy as Elaine Parker, and she was in The Gay Deceivers. Oh, she was in The Gay Deceivers. Yeah. Your silly queen. 
Beverly Hills, Body Snatchers, Never Cry Devil, Ride in the Edge, Twice Dead, Stewardess School, Explorers, and more. Now, Brooke Bundy is one of those actors that I thought was a bigger star. Yeah. She actually was. I, I really thought she was prestigious uh, actress, but no, I mean, she's just been in a lot of cult films. Oh, wow. Good for her. Oh, well, she's great. I think she's fantastic yeah. in this film. Yeah, I think she does a great job. Shall we talk about our feature presentation? Yes. One, two, three, he's coming for you. What? He's close. Oh. Two. He's real, isn't he? He's right, though. He's real. Three. Ready or not, Freddy's back. A Nightmare on Elm Street, Part 3. Dream Warriors, rated R. Starts Friday at a theatre near you. So we start with a title card saying Sleep, Those Little Slices of Death, How I Loathe Them by Edgar Allan Poe. And then we're taken to 1987 and during the opening credits, two years after the events of the previous film, teenager Kristen Parker is making a paper mache replica of Nancy Thompson's house from the first film. And because it's the 80s, she turns on Dokens into the fire, eats some instant coffee powder and takes a sip of some Diet Pepsi. Yeah, um, Dokken are a huge part of this film. Yeah. They're Into the Fire and Dream Warriors, the the title song for the film, are throughout. Yeah. Prominent throughout the whole thing. This was the... F- I don't know. Maybe I'm misremembering. But this is the first real horror film I felt had a strong heavy metal soundtrack. I think so. And it's it became a thing for the 80s and it needs to make a comeback. Mm. It is absolutely iconic to have hair metal playing in this uh, super camp 80s film. I suppose from the original film, the song at the end, that I can never remember, but it goes yeah. off. I love it. That's a bit heavy hair metal, isn't it? It is. It's close to it, yeah. But what I remember from Freddy's Revenge is... Obviously, touch me all night long. Mm. And um, have you ever seen a dream walk? Yeah, and I mean, by the time we get to part four, it goes camp again and very poppy. Um, but this is a hair metal film with a hair metal soundtrack. It's a bit, I'm here for it. Yeah, and I, I think f- for me personally, the whole franchise um, is a great example of MTV horror. Yeah, it's a teen audience. It has the music in there. It's for a teen audience. It's that pop cultural yeah. zeitgeist kind of quippy horror. Freddy Krueger, you know, mm. I'm just throwing words out. Yeah, there. no, no. I mean, for me, part four is the MTV horror film. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, but yeah, Kristen's mum is fuming that she's playing 80s hair metal out loud while she's trying to get some dick. She she really is, yeah. Um, Elaine, she brought a man back. Yeah. So it's it's it feels like a bit of a reference to the original, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Where uh, Tina's mother is too busy with a fella to notice that her daughter's in turmoil. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um. Yeah, she's got a, a good little. Uh... One liner that comes back in the next film's files. Andelay. Andelay. Yeah. So this is what she's famous for. Um, <laughs> it's I, it's the word itself. It seems so random in the in the context of the film. But it's the way she says it yeah. as well. She's like, "You better get to bed." Andelay. Yeah. Um, Kristen says, "I've been having those awful dreams again," and <laughs> her mum's like, "Honey, I have a guest." And she's like, "And you don't want to keep him waiting." She's like, that's right, I don't. Um, Elaine appears to be very rich. Yeah. I don't know what she's done. Um, the husband died, so maybe Probably. she had, he had a good life insurance. Mm-hmm. Um, but she, she's living well. She's, she's a queen. Yeah. And she, she needs to be a better mother. Yeah. She's a queen. And now we've got our first bit of horror in the film. Kirst, uh, Kristen falls asleep and dreams that Freddy Krueger is chasing her. At first, she witnesses a performance by the Jump Rope Girls of the Freddy Nursery Rhyme. Yes, they're back again with their hit single. Yeah. They've gone platinum this time. She then meets a little girl on a bike who she follows into Nancy's house and down to the boiler room. 
She picks up the little girl. She's like, call me the little girl. <laughs> she is literally like, little girl. <laughs> little girl. <laughs> little girl. And uh, runs away from Freddy into a room of hanging teenagers before the little girl turns into a skeleton and Kristen wakes up and is like, what's going on? Fuck, okay, we are back. This is given first film... You know, we're, Freddy's not trying to possess her. This is the real deal. Yeah, and this the is, lore is back. The lore is back, and it's a lot more elaborate. Yeah, the, the house is big. It's, it's kind of giving music video. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's used in the music video yeah. for Dokken's Dream Warriors. Yeah, and that in itself is iconic. Yeah, um, everything's bigger, everything's yeah bolder. You know, you've got. Hanging bodies from the ceiling. Yeah. Um, you've got a ghost child or whatever mm. turning into a skeleton. Yeah. you got all that business. So it's like, okay, I know what you're doing here. Yeah. And Freddy's kind of just back. Um, he's just back. But in the original draft, uh, Wes Craven's original draft, Freddy was supposed to be born at the beginning of the film in a ranch-style house, which was supposed to be the place where his victims wound up. Revealing that was why Freddy always came back again and again in the dream world as that was his original resting. Also, Nancy and her father were supposed to burn it down, but Freddy's influence on it wouldn't allow it to happen until they eventually do it in the climax where it takes the last survivor, Kristen, back in time to when Freddy was born, who tries to kill her. She would throw the infant Freddy across the wall many times, wraps the Freddy glove around for a good grip and stabs the baby with the glove. (laughs) a little elaborate isn't it it's a bit much it's not necessary is it really not not entirely um but i would have also seen baby freddy being thrown around yeah well the original film she just takes back the energy it's very good it's a great analogy um the second film another analogy good kiss of a woman (laughs) or the kiss of a good woman uh, either way really it um, didn't need all that. No. It didn't need all go time travel, baby murder, all that stuff. Yeah. And yet, apart from the baby murder, we still get some of those elements in future films. That's true. Freddy uh, attacks Kristen in her bathroom after she thinks she had already awoken, making it look like she slit her wrists in the real world. Yeah, so really cool effect. And yes. you're going to hear me say that a lot. Oh my God. Um, of the cl- the tap coming up and turning into the claw. Four point five million dollars went a long way. Yeah, it really did. Uh, whoever did the special effects, and there was a, a real team of them, by all accounts, they did a stellar job. Yeah, I think the special effects in this one uh-huh. are some of the best for the whole series. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Really, yeah. Um, believing Kristen to be suicidal, her mother admits her to Western Hills Psychiatric Hospital, where she's placed under the care of Dr. Neil Gordon. Now, according to Wes Craven, the idea for the mental hospital treating the Dream Warriors was not just some riff on one flew over the cuckoo's nest, as many people thought it was at the time, but uh, instead inspired by real-life establishments. Uh, he said, and I quote, at that time, there was kind of a movement of such places that even advertised on television. So then they should trouble child and we'll make them okay. And essentially they were like prisons or insane asylums. The original idea for the film centered around the phenomenon of children traveling to a specific location to commit suicide, which dreams, uh, with dreams of Freddy Krueger eventually uh, discovered to be a common link between the youths. At the time in America, um, I suppose probably worldwide, but specifically in America, teen suicide was a taboo social issue. And this led to the abandonment of that storyline with some aspects remained within the film version, uh, which still depicts suicide and self-mutilation. This was deemed less controversial because these acts are committed with Freddy's distinct influence, inserting enough fantasy into the acts to remove them from the supposed controversial exploitation of disturbed youths. Yeah, it's a huge theme of the whole franchise. Um, Very clear in this film, though. The theme of the older generation, the parents, either number one, ignoring their children or refusing to understand yeah. their children and very much linked to real life issues, mm-hmm. particularly in the 80s. But it's still as old as time, really. Hey, I mean, 
parents uh, and the older generation fucking up the kids' future. We're living it. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's very political. It's still valid today. Yeah. This idea of the future generations confusing older people. Mm. So they refuse to participate yeah. in their children's and lives. Paying for their actions. Absolutely. You yeah. know, paying for the... You know, this is still not that far removed from something like the Vietnam War, which had a huge effect yeah. on horror cinema yeah. afterwards, you know? Um, it's very interesting, and I think it's something that really sets the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise apart from other yeah. slasher film franchises. Oh, definitely. Because I do think this is a theme that runs throughout. Yeah. It's a very interesting one. Um, the, the parents and the children, you know, something like Friday the 13th, the parents pretty much aren't there. Yeah. Never mentioned no. not there. You know, the same with Halloween. Mm -hmm. But with A Nightmare on Elm Street, the lack of parental yeah. guidance is a huge part mm -hmm. of why Freddy Krueger is able to do what he does. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Which is why I think it makes the Nancy Thompson character here so much more important because mm. she's that older figure there. Not like old enough to be their mums, but that older figure that knows what they're going through and guides them through and helps them. And it's such a nice touch. Yeah, yeah. She's that connection yeah. for them. And she's able to show empathy yeah. for their situation, um, which is really important. Yeah, Neil chats with Nurse Max Daniels, who has a theory that the recent trend of teenagers committing suicide is because of their parents dropping acid in the 60s. <laughs> Which is a funny take on yeah. the children being punished uh, for their uh, parents' misdoings. <laughs> uh, at the hospital, Kristen fights the orderlies uh, who try to sedate her because she fears falling asleep. But the new intern therapist, Nancy Thompson, comes in the room, serves the room... And manages to calm her down and befriend her by reciting part of the Jump Rope Girls anthem. She's still got that grey hair yeah. streak. She's oh, wearing... Her hair is huge. It's huge. She's giving she, business casual. She is in a grey tweed jacket and a grey skirt. Uh, almost a pencil skirt just yeah. below the knee. It's, it's a real serve. She looks so grown up. She looks yeah. 20 years old. Um... <laughs> What a queen. Uh, Nancy and Neil go for a walk together and he tells her how impressed he is with how much she served and how much she helped Kristen. It's like, girl, you just walked into that room and everyone's jaws were on the floor. Their wigs <laughs> flew. They did. Nancy drops her bag and Dr. Gordon finds a bottle of Hypnosil, a drug that suppresses nightmares. Ooh. And he then spots a nun, who, do you know what, also serving a little bit, uh, called Sister Mary Hel Helena... <laughs> Watching him from a distance. She doesn't look like the other nuns, does she? She's, there's a bit of glamour there. There's a, there's a little something to the outfit. I, I don't think nuns... You know, you don't have to show skin or be too flamboyant to serve. I, it's true. I, you know, and I think a little adjustment... Have you, have you watched Sister Act? I think Bonnie Bobby Aaron Goldberg. serves. She does serve. You, you know, know, with her glowing eyes. Whoopi Goldberg absolutely serves yeah. in Sister Act. And so does Maggie Smith. Yeah. I don't think it's a bad outfit, Nun's outfit. No. <laughs> Nancy is introduced to the rest of Neil's patients. Philip, a habit, a batch, oh my God. Habitual. Habitual. Habitual sleepwalker. sleepwalker. Jennifer, a hopeful television actress who is prone to cigarette burns. Will, who uses a wheelchair due to a prior suicide attempt. Next up. Someone we've met in person. Ooh. I mean, I've met Robert Englund in person. Ooh. I, was, I was fucking terrified. I was 11 years old. Um, <laughs> but Taryn, a recovering drug addict, played by Jennifer Rubin, who, um, fun fact, accidentally groped my ass. Yes. And I'm absolutely fine with that. Yeah. yeah. Queen. An absolute pleasant lady to talk to. Um, she was told by some of her fans that her character of Taryn had caused them to quit drugs, and she's very proud of that. And she should be. Yeah, definitely. Joey, the youngest, who was too traumatized to speak, and Kincaid, a tough kid from the streets who is prone to violence. Ken Sagos plays Kincaid, 
And he stated in an interview he really didn't want to audition for this role, uh, but his agent talked him into going. On the day of the audition, he walked in heavy rain to catch the bus to the location. He showed up completely drenched and had to sit down and wait for a few hours due to the auditions running late. When it was his turn, Chuck Russell told him, do whatever you want to do. So he was so frustrated and mad about the ordeal that he yelled, fuck you, and then proceeded to scream and curse out Russell, and he was hired immediately. Um, yeah. It, it's kind of a one note. <laughs> it's kind yeah. Of the, he's, he's a very angry young man, <laughs> and that seems to be the point. And that's yeah. okay. And you know what? I really love all the characters in this film. Like, there's some, a lot of slasher films where there's always that one fucking I don't think there's a single one in this film that annoys me. I'm absolutely living for all of them. Yeah, the success of the film lives and dies on how, number one, likeable these teens are. Yeah. And number two, how relatable they are. Yeah. And, I mean, I can't really relate too much to it, but teens at the time, you know, maybe could have related. You know, yeah. it's why... The Jennifer, uh, not Jennifer, excuse me, the Taryn character helped people recover from yeah. a drug addiction. Because these are really well-written characters mm. for a slasher film. Yeah. They get a massive amount of time, but the time that we do get with them is really well done. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely. Nancy speaks with Kristen's mother, who won't take her question seriously. And then gathers Kristen things and finds the paper mache house whilst Neil elsewhere does his research on hypnosis to get some more tea on Nancy Thompson. That night, Kristen falls asleep whilst drawing a picture of Nancy's house. She is obsessed with it. She loves the exterior design. She ends up... (laughs) Is it Ronnie Blakey's leg still sticking out the door? She's a big 90-minute makeover fan. She's thinking of all the things she can do with that house. 60-minute makeover, isn't it? 60 minute makeover. She ends up back in the house. Where it's is it 60 or 90? I think it's 60. Is this a Mandela effect? Maybe. Write in and let us know. Write in? If they have a Halloween special, also let us know. We've been on Halloween kicks, so it'd be nice to watch. <laughs> Halloween makeover. She ends up back in the house where a dead pig rots and gives her a jump scare. Oh. An actual rotted an pig. Actual rotted pig. It's revolting. Yeah. And Freddy, in a bizarre series of events, turns into a penis-looking snake and tries eating her, but she unwittingly pulls Nancy into her dream, allowing them to escape when Nancy stabs Freddy in the eye with a piece of glass. The Freddy snake is a phallic masterpiece. It, yeah. It looks so good. It looks amazing. The crew had only one hour to film the scene, um, so once they realised it looked like a dick, they didn't have time to paint it. So it was covered in a green goo substance to overcome the pinkish uh, colour on it. The scene involving the Freddy Snake attempting to swallow Kristen was also filmed backwards and then played in reverse due to the gums on the puppet being too flexible and were folding over themselves. But the finished product is incredible. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a great scene. Again, the special effects look fantastic, particularly for 1987. And it's memorable. This yeah. is a memorable scene. It's another one of those moments from the franchise that people remember. Yeah. It's like I said, you know, this is another great example of this film taking full advantage of the concept of the franchise. Yeah. You know, Freddy's a scary dream demon. Of course he's going to fucking turn himself into a penis snake. Yeah. You know, why not? Yeah. Yeah, he, he has control in people's yeah. dreams. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Kristen reveals that she's been able to pull people into her dreams since she was young. And Nancy informs her that she used to live in the house that Kristen made a model of. I don't know how she fit in there. It's very small. <laughs> I'm loving Nancy's floral jacket. Yes. In this scene. I even she like her casual. She out some looks. Yeah, even a casual oh. jumper and jeans oh, she saves pink. her life. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she's, it's been a glow up. I'm sorry, it has been it has. a glow up. It has. Even if a, you know, pink jumper and the original is iconic. It is iconic, but this is definitely a glow up. The next night, Nancy goes on a date with Neil, and she tells him how her mother died date, in her sleep. How dare you? She's a professional lady. She tells him how her mother died in her sleep. Her relationship with her father has fallen apart, and the patients at Western Hills are in real danger. 
She asks for permission to give them hypnosis, but Neil refuses. And I love the scene. It always stands out for me because of the end of the scene when he's like, no, I'm not giving him hypnosis. He won't allow it. She pulls, I believe it's a pair of chopsticks out of a packet. And she just rolls her eyes and gives him such a look. And it's like, oh my God, that is original Nancy Thompson material. That is her in the original. That's exactly how she acted. That sort of, I don't give a shit attitude. Yeah. And I, that always stands out for me. I love it. There'll be a different uh, diary entry that evening. Wow, well, well, yeah. Oh, Mr. Gordon. <laughs> doctor, <laughs> excuse me, Dr. Gordon. Oh. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the hospital, Freddy transforms himself into one of Philip's puppets before growing to full size again to use Philip's veins from his arms and feet as puppet strings. He walks into the roof and throws him off it. And this scene is one of the most brilliantly disgusting scenes in the entire franchise. This was the first of two scenes that re- people really spoke about. Spoiler alert, I've already yeah. told you the other one. Um, but this one was the one, like, oh my god, this is yeah. this happens in the film, I can't believe it. Um, and it lived up to the hype Yeah. when I finally watched it, because it looks fantastic. Yeah. Very gruesome. Um, the idea of it is yeah. very gruesome. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great scene, a great death scene. Yeah, and, you know, it's great proof that you don't need CGI to have these big elaborate effects Mm. because I mean, this is just all practical. Everything here is practical and it just, it looks phenomenal. And it really, it's one of those scenes that really just gets under your skin. No pun intended, Uh, but also the Freddy puppet as well. Looks so good. The stop motion that he uses to bring it to life. Oh my God. It looks amazing. True. Dr. Elizabeth Sims and Neil try their best to convince the patients that Philip committed suicide at the next group session. Kincaid kicks off and gets put in a quiet room and Neil tells Dr. Sims that he's prescribing hypnocell to the patients until they can figure out what's going on with their dreams. Yeah, so the character of Elizabeth Sims... Yeah. um, It's interesting, the Never Sleep Again documentary, a fantastic documentary that I fully recommend to yeah to watch if they love nightmare on elm street priscilla pointer thinks that and i maybe i agree to a certain degree that elizabeth sims thought she was doing the best yeah but she was ignorant Mm. to their pleas yeah and she was very much set in her ways and couldn't see things from the teenager's perspective Mm -hmm. and ultimately that leads to a few of the deaths yeah you know, she, but I think she's maybe the most interesting character because she is a sort of proxy for the adults. Yeah. Because you can't have all their uh, parents mm-hmm. in this film. So you kind of have her as a stand in yeah. for that parental figure for the adults. Mm-hmm. And she says stuff like, you won't make any progress until you recognize your dreams for what they are. Yeah. The byproducts of guilt. Psychological scars stemming from moral conflicts and overt sexuality. Mm-hmm. And this is essentially, and this is very 80s, um, you know, the Ronald Reagan era, where the teens are blamed for their own problems. Yeah. The teens are, you know, I, d- I don't know what to do. My teenager is out of control. It's drugs. It's alcohol. Uh-huh. It's overt sexuality. It's homosexuality, you know, it's the AIDS pandemic. Mm. All of that yeah. was blamed on the, the victims. Yeah. Was bl- blamed on the youth culture. Mm-hmm. And I think she sort of antipathies, I may have made that word up, that sort of sensibility yeah. in the 80s, that Reaganism yeah. in the 80s, um, which is very interesting because... You know, she does think that she's doing the best. Yeah. But ignorance isn't an excuse. And she's ignorant and she's not listening to them. Yeah. She thinks she's doing the best, but she's not. She's mm-hmm. actually making things worse. 
And she says, I'm not going to take any more of this. How much longer are you going to go on blaming your dreams for your own weaknesses? Yeah. Um, and I, I, yeah, she's really, I mean, Freddy Krueger is obviously the bad guy. Yeah. But she's also an antagonist. Yeah, no, definitely. And Priscilla Pointer is so good. She's really good. She's very good. Yeah. Jennifer stays up late watching TV and tries to keep herself awake by burning herself with a cigarette. Um, never nasty scene. I never nasty. Knows what it's like to be burnt by cigarette. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, Jennifer changes the channels and puts on the Dick Cavett show, where he's interviewing Dick. It's an interesting name. Where he's interviewing Shasha Gabor. Now, for the dream sequence, uh, this dream sequence, uh, Sally Kellerman was originally in the script as the guest, but Cavett was then allowed to pick the person he'd be interviewing. And he picked Shasha Gabor because he thought she was the dumbest person he'd ever met in his life and he'd never have her on his show in real life. So if there's one person he wanted to kill be, to be killed by Freddy, it would be her. In the advance release posters, funny enough, this is absolutely bizarre to me, only Dick Cavett was credited um, because it was unsure who Dick's guest in his scene would be. By the time the film was released... Gabor had been picked by Cavett for the scene. The scene had been filmed and her name was on there as well as Dick Cavett's. That's such a small cameo to appear on the poster. Um, yeah. That's so bizarre. I suppose it's a big name. I mean, who who in this film, you know, uh, in 1987, is she a big name? It's true. I mean, technically it'd be Robert Englund, really. Really, uh, John Saxon, John maybe. Saxon, yeah. Um, but Dick Cavett was a TV interviewer, yeah. you know, yeah, very famous. Zaza Gabor, old Hollywood glamour. Yeah. Um, I do. I don't know if she was in on the joke mm-hmm. when she's talking about her acting and her learning to act and her craft of acting. Yeah. When uh, very famously, she was kind of only really known for all of her um, marriages. Yeah. <laughs> really? She kind of, a bit like a Kim Kardashian type. And she talks about how much she loves animals as well. Yeah, which is nice. <laughs> which is nice. Um, but yeah, this interview's going on. Um, she talks about how to succeed as an actress. Yeah. And Dick Cavan says, can I ask you something? She's like, certainly. And he's like, who gives a fuck what you think? And turns into Freddy Krueger. Yes. And he attacks her. He attacks her, and Jennifer switches the channel. That is the height of camp. It is Freddy Krueger attacking Zaza Gabor. It really is. It really is so good. And you know, just when you thought the scene couldn't get any better, the TV turns static. Jennifer goes up to it, and Freddy's arms appear out of the side of the TV, and his head comes up through the top of it. He grabs her, lifts her up. And he says, this is it, Jennifer, your big break in TV. Whack on the prime time, bitch. And then smashes her head into the television and kills her. A line that, like a lot of Freddy Krueger's one-liners, was fucking improvised. Yeah. It was just, this is it, Jennifer, your big break on TV. Yeah. And he said that for the first two takes. But on the third take, when um, Chuck Russell went for an alternative angle shot, he changed it to work onto prime time, bitch. And Chuck Russell couldn't decide which version to use, so he just edited it all together. Um, and it's now Freddy's defining one-liner. It really is. And this is why Robert England is so integral yeah. to the franchise. Because in the original film, it was just... Freddy Krueger was just meant to be played by a stuntman. Yeah. And there wouldn't be much to his character. He mm-hmm. would just be... Very much, maybe like Jason yeah. and, and Michael, where he didn't speak very much. Um, obviously, Robert England got the part. Robert England being a actor, um, mm-hmm. a, a good, very good actor, and he brought so much to the role and being able to ad lib something as iconic as that, yeah. which has you know been synonymous with the films ever since. Yeah is the mark of a very, very good actor. And it's the start of Freddy Krueger talking like a drag queen. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. Because he he had the one-liners. Yeah. 
in the first film and the second film. But they weren't really funny. Mm. But that one is it's it's a pun. Yeah. It's it's funny. Yeah. Um people hate that aspect of Freddy Krueger and it's a conversation we're gonna have a lot over the yeah. next few weeks. Um some people hate that aspect. But I really think this is the film that started that yeah. aspect of Freddy's character. And it had the perfect balance, this one. Yeah. You know, of scary and funny and camp. Yeah. Um, I personally like the direction with Freddy Krueger. You yeah. Know, it just brings more of the camp value. And Robert Englund absolutely nails it. But um, it brings into a question, actually, I was going to ask you at the start of the episode. Do you think you'd have loved it as much if you watched it in the 80s and it was a new film in the franchise? A la... Halloween ends, let's say. It's yeah. the best example of a recent film um, that surprised everyone with its direction. And, you know, obviously, Nightmare on Elm Street 1 or 2, very over the top. But this is like a whole other level. This is another building. You know, this is so over the top. I think I would have, if my if I was around then and my taste was similar to, it is now, to what it is now, my mind would be blown. But can you see how audiences may have felt back then with this change? Yeah, potentially. Um, it depends what you watch horror films for. Yeah. I've never been someone who particularly watches horror films to be scared. Mm. I think there's a great camp value in horror and that's what I'm drawn to a lot yeah. with horror. So I think I would have really enjoyed this. Mm. I do think that this film is very much influenced by um, sort of teen films at the time. Yeah. Now they are all our, they all are teen films. Yeah. But I feel like this emphasizes more on that John Hughes kind of style. Um, the Goonies was a huge success. Yeah, there is a famous... Just prior. Yeah, I mean, there's a famous photo of uh, Nancy Thompson and Dream Warriors and Freddy Krueger recreating The Breakfast Club. Yeah, um, yeah. Thing. So yeah, no, definitely. I think it's definitely a product of the 80s, definitely a product of the teen films that were yeah. so popular at that point mm-hmm. and incorporating that into horror, yeah. into A Nightmare on Elm Street. And... Seemingly, it wasn't for everyone, mm. but it was for the majority of people. Because yeah. again, this film was a huge success, yeah. and the next one was a huge success too. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely an audience for it. I think I would have really enjoyed this yeah. film. No, definitely same. Um, so next up, uh, Sister Mary Helena is speaking to Neil at uh, Jennifer's funeral. She says. What faith do you follow? And he's like, well, science, I suppose. And she's like, oh, sad choice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is an overtly religious film. Yeah. As well. Yeah. It's very religious. So, something I try to ignore. <laughs> yeah. It's weird, though. Religion and horror is something that actually works. I mean, look at The Exorcist, one of the best films ever made. Mm. Um, but it's, it's strange, though, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of like watching supernatural films but not believing in the supernatural you can still follow ghost films and feel scared and invested in them without believing in ghosts yeah that's like the best comparison i could think of anyway yeah i i suppose you know if the person writing the film is a religious person um i think maybe sometimes it's an easy way to defeat the evil in the film. I oh, don't, yeah. You know, if I wrote a horror film, I don't know, maybe I would make it... I, I probably wouldn't go with Christianity. Yeah. Um, but bring a bit of religion mm-hmm. or spirituality into things to make it easier. Yeah. <laughs> like, when in doubt, just, like, have God defeat him. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't know how to write uh-huh. your ending. Um. Yeah, so she's speaking to Neil... Uh, and tells him the unquiet spirit needs to be put to rest in order to save the children. But they're rightfully interrupted by Nancy Thompson because she needs to show off her funeral attire. Oh my god. What a sleigh this is. Yeah. In the original film, her funeral attire is a very bright, <laughs> kind of childish dress. Yeah. Bright blue dress. Um, but she's giving me hats. Mm-hmm. 
she's given me just um, buried my fifth husband oh she's given me a that's like a bomb yeah <laughs> all she needed was a veil and I think it really would have given the full dynasty serve so, girl this is a funeral you have no right slaying this hard oh funerals <laughs> are the easiest place to serve well because everyone else is because look everyone so looks boring. good in black <laughs> They go back to his place and Nancy tells him the truth about what's going on. So in their next group session, Nancy reveals to the remaining patients that they are the last of the Elm Street kids. <gasps> the surviving children of those who banded together and burned Freddy Krueger to death many years ago. In a camp series of events, uh, Nancy and Neil encourage them to try group hypnosis so that they can experience a shared dream and discover their dream powers. <laughs> in the dream... This is the part where it's get for me is giving the Goonies. Yeah. yeah. Is them coming together uh-huh. in their dreams and finding their dream powers. Yeah. Which on paper is fucking cheesy as fuck. Mm-hmm. But I actually think it kind of works. Of course it does, yeah. With how ridiculous the rest of the film is. Yeah. Um, so in the dream, Will can walk and make butterflies appear. He says, in my dreams, I can walk. In my dreams... I'm the wizard master. <laughs> this, for me, is maybe the part that doesn't quite work. <laughs> Why? I think it's just a little too cheesy. He's the wizard master. It's, yeah, but it's, it's, it's yeah, it's cheesy. <laughs> Kristen could do trips and flips, tricks and flips. Yeah, Patricia Arquette's stunt double does some uh, cool <laughs> gymnastics. Good wig, good wig. wig. Yeah, yeah. Kincaid has stru- super strength. Yeah, he bends the chair legs with ease. And best of all, Taryn is a punk. She turns around in a punk gear, mohawk, leather, the lot. And she's like, in my dreams, I'm beautiful. She opens her flick knives and she says, and bad. <laughs> Iconic. It is iconic. She was surprised. When we met her and we said this is our favourite one, she thought it was going to be Let's let's Get High. Like Freddy Krueger's like, no, 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 bitch. It's Beautiful and Bad. Beautiful and Bad. Sign my box set with Beautiful and Bad, please. It's high camp. It's very 80s. It's aggressively 80s. It is. It's been a while since we've talked about Switchblades on the podcast. It is. (laughs) Um, Aggressively 80s. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we quote with this to death when we first got together. And also, she was beautiful before. Let's yeah. just say that. But oh my god, yeah, I'm she's but... her own person now. Yeah, she's a beautiful in her own way. And bad, and bad. Meanwhile, Joey wanders off and is captured by Freddy, who disguises himself as a nurse that Joey has a crush on, leaving him comatose in the real world and tied to a bed above how with tongues in the dream world. And... <laughs> Already a never great one line. It's like, what's wrong, Joey? Feeling tongue tied. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's seduced by Freddie, who's pretending to be the nurse, uh-huh. who takes her top off. And there, there was special effects made to have Freddie's head on the actress's torso. Yes. So it would be Freddie in just a pair of white knickers. <laughs> And when I tell you the photos <laughs> of this are uh, haunting, <laughs> it does. They didn't keep it in because it doesn't work. It no. doesn't work. And like they said, you know, and I agree, Freddie is Robert England. Yeah. So to have somebody else look like Freddie in the face, mm-hmm. it just doesn't work. It doesn't look the same. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Haunting image. But don't worry, we still get Robert Englund in drag as a nurse in the future of the franchise. We do, yes we do. Nancy and Neil are relieved of duty once Joey's in his uh, coma. Yeah, um, Dr... Is it Dr. Sims? Dr. Sims! Yeah, that's why in my head I was like, is it Dr. Yes, Sims? Because I feel like saying Dr. Sims. Uh, yeah, Dr. Sims. <laughs> I hope people get these references. Silent Night, Daddy Night. <laughs> uh, but Do- Dr. Sims, um, she blames it on the hypnosil. Yeah. And, as you would. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've started taking hypnosil, and now one of them's in a coma. Yeah. You, you would kind of blame the hypnosil, uh-huh. let's be fair. Sister Mary Helena um, decides it's time to give Neil all the backstory he needs about Freddy. 
He is the son of a young woman on the hospital staff called Amanda Kruger, who was accidentally locked in a room with hundreds of mental patients who raped her continually. She explains the only way to stop him is to lay his bones to rest. Um, yeah, the bastard son of a hundred maniacs. Yeah. Which I thought was a little much. Mm. It's kind of, it's a bit, you know, knowing, well, we've always known. I mean, it's dark. It's very you know, dark. Compared to the rest of the film. And it, it's, I mean... The idea of somebody being sexually assaulted by 100 people mm. um, for a prolonged period of time is incredibly disturbing. Yeah. Incredibly. And for me, it seemed a little flippant. Mm. It, it it was kind of to make a really cool bastard son of a, you know, 100 maniacs yeah. thing. But when you really think about it, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah not... Yeah, I, I would hope that if this film was made now, it, that mm. aspect would have been treated a little more delicately. Yeah. No, or, or not not having to have that. It's uh-huh. not really necessary. Why can't he just be an evil guy? Yeah. You know? Back at the hospital, Nancy is sitting with Joey, and she's like, let go of him, you bastard. And Freddy Claus... <laughs> I love having like a camp's... Uh performance in this film and i love the way she says that it, it her acting is a, a better yeah. than the original yeah. now i loved her in the original but there were some iffy uh-huh. moments here's looking at you were uh, how you say i don't take murder seriously <laughs> um but it's much better in this it is yeah she's grown she's a grown-ass woman she embraces it and brings the melodrama she does. And so does Freddy, because he claws into Joey's chest the words, come and get him, bitch. Yeah, <laughs> into, yeah into his torso. <laughs> do you think in part four, spoiler alert, mm. uh, Joey survives, do you think in part four he still has that on his torso? Don't we see his like, torso? Like, scarred. Don't we see it. No, it's not there. Oh, uh, do we see his torso? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because yeah. he's getting a bit Yeah. Free. Yeah. Whoa. That's something to look forward to next episode. <laughs> Neil and Nancy ask her father, Officer Donald Thompson, where the bones are hidden. But he's drunk and uncooperative. Uh, he's been uh, he's been reduced to security now at a shopping mall, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's really struggling to deal with the events of the first film, and he is uncooperative because he still doesn't believe Nancy. Yeah. And, you know, he says, Fred Krueger is dead. You've always had such a hard time understanding that. Mm-hmm. Um, re- again, you know, a parental figure that doesn't believe their child. Yeah. Um, and, spoiler alert, he's punished for it, yeah. eventually. Like Ronnie Blakely was, in mm-hmm. the, like Marge was in the original. Nancy rushes back to the hospital after Neil is alerted by Taryn that Kristen has been sedated. Neil stays behind to convince Donald to help them, and uh, when he agrees, they stop off at a church so Neil can grab some holy water on the way to where Freddy's remains were buried. Mm -hmm. Um, Attacking Freddy Krueger with holy water is high camp, by the way. (laughs) Do you think holy water in general is camp? Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, it's a bit. It, I yeah. always get this scene mixed up with the Lost Boys holy water scene. Oh, okay. Both have a bit of a comedic, comedic yeah. side to it whilst they're stealing holy water. Um, like, even in the Exorcist, same year as well. It's a bit camp, and it's a bit camp. <laughs> yeah. Spraying someone with water. Oh! <laughs> I mean, she starts speaking Latin when he sprays them with fake holy water, and that. that's even more camp. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's happened to me a few times, but. <laughs> Nancy and the others uh, again engage in group hypnosis to reunite with Kristen, but they're all separated by Freddy. Kristen appears back in her bedroom. Freddy appears, cuts off her mother's head, yes. and her mum still speaks to her. She's like, God damn it, Kristen, you always ruin everything. Every time I bring a man home, you spoil it. You know what your shrink says, you're just trying to get some attention. Yeah. <laughs> While she's a severed head. Yeah. <laughs> what is it that Freddy says? <laughs> Oh, what's the drink? Oh, bourbon. bourbon. Well, where's the fucking where's bourbon? Where's the fucking bourbon? <laughs> so good. So good. 
Taryn finds herself in an alleyway where Freddy confronts her and she's like, okay, Hasso, let's dance. The switchblades come out and they have a fight with flick knives and he's using his finger blades. So camp. Yeah. Uh, he's he's uh, graffitied. Freddy loves Taryn on the wall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he, Freddy says, let's get high. And his fingers turn into syringes and holes with mouths appear on her arms. Yeah, another great and they're, effect. They're like they're sucking. They're, they're like trying to get to needle. Honestly, it looks disgusting. It's fantastic. And he stabs the holes and kills her. And he's like, uh, "What a rush!" <laughs> Originally, her head was supposed to explode, but the effect didn't quite work. No, it's a shame, really. Yeah, that would have made it even better. Um, Will is then confronted by Freddy and a bladed wheelchair in an alleyway. <laughs> Uh, Will transforms fully into the wizard master, cape and everything, and destroys the wheelchair and fights Freddy with his magic fingers. <laughs> it's cheesy. <laughs> it's very cheesy. And Freddy picks him up and goes, sorry kid, I don't believe in fairy tales, and kills him. Yeah. Stabbing him. So this is Freddy using people's history yeah. uh, within their death scenes. Because uh, you didn't really see that in the original. No. Or Freddy's Revenge. No. But you see it afterwards, mm-hmm. where people's personalities are used in the dream sequences yeah. to kill them. Um, another thing that some people hate and some people love within the franchise. Yeah. In one of the scenes, um, a giant Transformers-style robot was meant to go up against Freddy, but... It made it into uh, it made it into the storyboard stage, but because of the budget, they they couldn't do it. So it was very elaborate. Whatever the original script was, it's very very <laughs> elaborate. Kristen, Nancy, and Kincaid find one another. Kincaid says, "Freddy, where are you hiding, you burnt face pussy?" <laughs> <laughs> and the trio rescues Joey, but are unable to defeat Freddy because he's become too powerful due to the souls he has absorbed. Uh, sensing that his remains have been found. Also, can we talk about how great his uh, chest looks with all the faces coming out? Oh, there? yeah. Yeah. Um, They do that again in the next film, don't yeah, they? Yeah, with a certain Slay Queen being inside there. Yes, yeah. Isn't that, what's the film with the pizza? Is that part five, the pizza one? Part four. Oh, part yeah. four, yeah. They love doing this effect, don't they? Uh-huh. Um, sensing that his remains have been found, Freddy appropriates his own skeleton in a Jason and the Argonauts style um, stop motion scene where the skeleton kills Donald before incapacitating Neil. Yeah, so Donald... It, it's a weird one because, I mean, Donald dies, but he doesn't sacrifice himself necessarily. No. Both of her parents get the most ridiculous deaths. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> Um, because, spoiler alert, it's Nancy herself that actually yeah. sacrifices yeah. Um, herself. Yeah, and Freddy returns to attack the others, but Joey uses his dream power voice to repel him. Donald, and he basically just screams at him. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> Donald tells Nancy, and this is camp, like, he appears with fairy dust around him. The idea of John Saxon, <laughs> one of the manliest men of ever manly men, appearing... In, like, this fairy <laughs> dust, essentially. Yeah. It's high cap. He tells Nancy that he's crossing over, but he's revealed to be Freddy and stabs Nancy in the stomach, <gasps> tossing her aside. Freddy, believing that Nancy is dead, uh, attacks Kristen in order to kill her, but a still-alive Nancy stabs him with his own glove. And Neil manages to recover and purifies Freddy's bones with holy water, killing him. Yeah, it's... <sighs> Shocking. Yeah. Having Nancy die. Uh-huh. I, I was very shocked when I first watched it and she's killed. Yeah. I'm very sad, actually. It is. You know, she she was in two films, but she was very much the, the final girl of A Night Run Elsie yeah. and still is. You know, no matter how many films, he's looking at you, Alice, mm. you know, others have been in, it's still kind of Nancy yeah. that people remember from yeah. A Night Run Elm Street. Although I do like Alice. It's, it's yeah, sorry. it's it's one of those where it's like I would love for Nancy to come back, but it's kinda like 
I don't want if they make a new film, I don't want them to ignore this film. No. I don't want them to ignore any of the sequels. I want them to keep it going because it's so good with continuity in this franchise. And yeah. But there is a way she can come back, and we'll get to that in a minute with mm. an original intention for this film. Um after Nancy dies, Kristen manages to awaken everyone and return them to the real world. During Nancy's funeral, Neil finds Amanda Kruger's tombstone and discovers that she <gasps> is Sister Mary Helen. Oh my god. That evening, he goes to sleep with the Malaysian doll Nancy gave him and Kristen's paper mache house nearby. And suddenly, Kristen's house lights up from the inside, suggesting that Freddy is not completely defeated. Dream Warriors by Dokken plays over the end credits. Oh. The iconic song. It's iconic. It goes off. It does. It, it really does. is. It's such a great song. And although that is Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3 Dream Warriors, yes. it almost uh, was a little different. Oh. So it was intended to be the last Nightmare on Elm Street film, and it was shot that way. While the ending of the film suggests that Freddy might not be dead at all, the scene in the shooting script makes it clear that it was not the case. In the scene, Dr. Gordon visits Kristen a few days after Freddy's defeat. Kristen reveals that she's moving to New York and uh, Dr. Gordon asks her if she's going to see her, referring to Nancy in her dreams. Oh. Kristen answers that she dreams of her every night, suggesting that Nancy guards her dreams. Oh. The scene then cuts to the ending, which plays in the finish as it was scripted, in which Neil is sleeping and the light turns on in the house model. It is implied that Nancy, not Freddy, turned on the light as she is guarding Gordon's <gasps> dreams. Oh. It's unknown if the scene was shot, but by leaving the scene out, it makes it appear that Freddy is still alive. Um, the scene where they discuss about her coming back in dreams. So yeah. That is how they could bring her back in a requel. As a dream guardian. Have her as a dream guardian. I, I imagine how camp that would be. That would be. She'd bring back all her old outfits... <laughs> I don't know if they could do a recall. I I would love to see it. Yeah. But I don't... And, and we can discuss it now because this is... It's going to be a while till we discuss Nancy Thompson again. So I don't think they could do a recall without it feeling a bit convoluted. Mm. Um, obviously, Halloween 2018 did it really well. I th- yeah. I thought they did it really well. Um, but it's very much realistic, you know? Yeah. And I just think because of what Nightmare on Elm Street is, I just don't know if they're able to do that. Mm. Like, what, it's going to be how many years? Uh, almost 40 years that she hasn't had a bad dream. Yeah. You know? Uh-huh. I Which, yeah, but that's what I mean. Have that's, her as a dream guardian. But that's why I'm not a screenwriter. Ha, have her as a dream guardian, and then you then have to explain that. That's true. Uh, on the VHS release, the music video for Dream Warriors appears after the credits, and it, the video contains scenes from the film, and ends when the band vanquishes Freddy, causing him to wake up from his nightmare and ask, who were those guys? Yeah. <laughs> Love that music video. But that's enough and Street free Dream Warriors. It is. Yeah. What a great film. Yeah. Just just really it it it's everything that I like in horror films. Mm-hmm. The good gory effects, likable characters, a level of camp yeah. and fun. Um it remembers to be a horror film mm-hmm. but has fun with it. Um I like the acting in it. I, yes, okay, I think the film's a little cheesy at times, but I can forgive that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I love it. I love that side of it and just how ridiculous it is. It's everything that a Nightmare on Elm Street film should be. Mm. Um, you know, to the point, like I said, it's it's close to being as good as the original. And yeah, one other film. Can say that in the franchise. Very much later on. But um, for now, yeah, this is the perfect sequel. Should we get to the awards? Oh, yes. Awards season. Biggest queen, I have Nancy Thompson. It's Nancy Thompson. And I don't have to explain why. No. <laughs> Biggest gasp. I have Freddy using Philip's veins as puppet strings. Because well, I remember when I first watched it, that was the scene that really shocked me the most. Mm. I went with uh, Nancy's death. Yeah, that is a big gasp. Best dialogue. It has to be a tie. 
between Work on the Prime Time Bitch and In My Dreams I'm Beautiful and Bad. <laughs> I went with Welcome to Prime Time Bitch. And That's Camp is also a tie between Kristen's mother, a camp outfit, and her ditching her exhausted daughter for a dick appointment, <laughs> and everything involving the dream powers. <laughs> um, That's Camp award goes to who gives a fuck what Zaza Gabor thinks. <laughs> well, yeah, that definitely deserves to be. Uh, ratings, I give it 10 burnt face pussies out of 10. <laughs> I give it 9 on delays out of 10. Uh, masterpiece, trash speech, trash basic, or a camp old bunch of fun. Now, it could very well be the latter, but I'm going to give it a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. It's a really well constructed horror film. Yeah. A, a really great slasher film. It's available on DVD, Blu ray, and video on demand. And if you enjoyed this, I recommend checking out How Bound, How Razor 2. Another nice. ATC call that is over the top and makes good use of its premise whilst bringing back a original character to help with a younger girl who looks a bit like Patricia Arquette. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you enjoyed this, check out New Mutants. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it all that much, but you might. That's why I didn't include it, you fucker. That's, I was going to put New Mutants. Pretty much the same fucking thing. It is, it is. But no, I, 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 I did not like New Mutants, yeah, it's, but it's you gener- might do. It's the generic version of Yeah, uh, you might Dream do. Warriors. Um, yeah, so talk to us on social media. We're Horror Court Trash over on Facebook and Instagram, Horror Court Trash on Twitter. We're also on TikTok as well. And I'm Dad Gaz92 on Letterboxd, Gazmo205 on Instagram, and GazCruz92 on Twitter. I'm Chris Barker823 on Instagram and Letterboxd. And we're also Gas Power Festival across all social media too. Go and have a look and see what it's all about. Give us a rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes, like and follow on everything else. Next week, it's double episode week, starting on Tuesday with the MTV horror film. Yes, the the official MTV horror film. <laughs> and Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master. Oh. I cannot wait to discuss that. I can't, I, I, yeah, I can't wait to watch it. And on Friday, <laughs> we'll be bringing you our latest Friday the 13th bonus episode. Wow. With another very MTV horror film. Perfect for spooky season. The other franchise that was included in Freddy vs. Jason, it's Friday the 13th, part 7, the New Blood. Wow. Jason versus Carrie. <laughs> I can't believe this is our seventh Friday the 13th I since starting the podcast. I, I genuinely didn't think we would ever make it to <laughs> even close to the end. Very optimistic there. <laughs> Why is it like another two years till our next Friday the 13th? No, it's next year. It's oh, next year. Okay. Yes, we'll be back same time, same place next week. Bye. Bye.